Hello, fellow tech enthusiasts. I would like to welcome you to our fourth course in the Zero to Hero series. Today, we will explore AWS Lambda. As part of Zero to Hero course series, our goal is to provide you with the knowledge necessary to excel in your implementational use case, as interviews, or tackle exam questions. If you have any doubt, or if you believe we are overlooking any important concepts, please leave a comment on this video and we will address it. Part of housekeeping task, who this course is for? This course is designed for anyone looking to brush up their AWS Lambda knowledge or preparing for any AWS certifications or want to learn AWS Lambda in depth for any implementational use cases. Regardless of your level of expertise with AWS Lambda, this course will add significant value to you. We believe if you complete this session without skipping any content, you will have the necessary knowledge and confident to handle any AWS Lambda use cases. In terms of prerequisites, you don't need any prior knowledge of serverless or AWS Lambda. I will teach you everything. As this is a lab-based hands-on course, I will expect you to follow along with me and implement all the Lambda scenarios we'll cover today. To perform this lab, you need AWS free tier account. If you don't have an AWS free tier account, you can pause the video here and quickly create one. I'll also provide some sample Lambda codes, documented step-by-step -step instruction to jumpstart your hands-on. Now let's get started with today's topic. We will start with Lambda overview. Then we'll demo different types of Lambda invocations, followed by Lambda destinations. Then we'll invoke Lambda function using S3 event notifications. Then we'll cover Lambda event source mapping, followed by Lambda security aspects. Then we'll move to Lambda environment variables, and we will demo how to store and retrieve plain text and encrypted environmental variables. We'll take a real life scenario and we'll demo Lambda external dependencies and its limitations. Followed by, we'll demo Lambda layers and we will cover how Lambda layers can help us to reduce the Lambda deployment packages. After covering Lambda layers, we will demo Lambda versions and aliases and how we can use version and aliases for Lambda deployment. We will also cover Lambda concurrency in great depth. Then we will review different Lambda monitoring and observability metrics and service maps and how to triage any Lambda errors. In the next block, we will cover Lambda networking concepts and when and why you should launch Lambda function inside your VPC. We'll launch Lambda inside our VPC and we'll test the connectivity. Then we'll cover Lambda containers. This is the latest improvement in AWS Lambda and we'll review how you can run container images as Lambda function. Today we'll review Lambda Edge as well and I will give you necessary codes, configurations and cloud formation script if you want to run Lambda Edge for your personal use case. Then we will demo Lambda function URL, followed by end-to-end CI-CD deployment process for Lambda. We will also discuss all the Lambda limits you should know, and then, like every Zero to Hero courses, I will give you the list of Lambda-based practices that you should follow when you will create Lambda function for any production and critical application use cases. Throughout the session, we have used real-life examples animations and live demos to make this course effective, interactive and easy to understand. If you encounter any error message or have trouble understanding any concepts, please note down the timestamp and drop a comment with the timestamp and the error message. I will try my level best to resolve the blocker for you. We have a lot to cover today. Let's jump right into it. Lambda is a secure event-driven, serverless compute that scale as needed and you will pay only for what you use. 
Now I know in this definition I have used lot of heavy terminologies like event driven, serverless and pay what you are using. Now let's try to straight one by one. We'll start with serverless. The word serverless can be deceptive most of the time. Serverless does not mean no server is required or the application is running without a server. Serverless means you as a consumer of the service will not manage or maintain any server. Let's try to understand the concept using one example. Let's assume we have a web application hosted in virtual servers like EC2 instances. When users invoke the application, the web UI interacts with the backend servers and returns the response to the user. When there is no application user, then also we have to maintain the server, maybe with lesser quantity. And we must take care all the aspects like waste patching, security patching, scalability, high availability, backup DR, and all other heavy lifting maintenance activities. In contrast, when you are hosting any services using Lambda, we will only write that function, upload the code in Lambda, and then it's AWS's responsibility to manage and maintain everything to run my application code. My service will be available when I need, at what quantity I need. Apart from the code management, I really don't have to think about the infrastructure where Lambda is running. Now let's try to understand what is event driven. Event driven means post based architecture instead of continuous pooling. If I'll try to explain using an example, let's say I have one SFTP location and then I have a scheduler. The scheduler pulls that SFTP location for any active file or any file that is pending after certain times. And once it will have some work, then it will process. But what we understand most of the time, there will be no files, no jobs. Then also the scheduler will invoke and scan that location. And that means this is unnecessary or wastage of resources because when you do not have any application or job, then also your resources are running. Now, if you try to see that in context of Lambda, let's say we have an S3 bucket and that S3 bucket is accessing all those incoming files, what it used to come to SFTP location. Whenever there is a file available to S3 bucket, S3 will automatically invoke Lambda. In this case, Lambda function is not scanning the S3 location continuously after a certain schedule. And that is the beauty of event driven. That means your server will be automatically invoked or the event will be pushed to Lambda function instead of Lambda is pulling for the event. And the last but not least, pay what we used or pay as you go. Let's say you have an web application and that is running only five minutes per month, but you have to pay for the entire month if you are going with an EC2 based architecture. In contrast, if you are using AWS Lambda and if you are using five minutes, then for that month, you are only going to pay billing for five minutes and Lambda supports very granular level of billing that we are going to review in later half of this course and Lambda will allow you to pay for millisecond of your execution time. Unlike EC2 instance, you are not paying when you are not running any compute work in that server. Now let's try to review what problem does Lambda solve. If we'll compare with Amazon EC2, Amazon EC2, it's a virtual server with customizable resource. That means you can select CPU, memory, storage, based on your requirement. EC2 requires management. That means you have to upgrade operating system. You have to upgrade security patches. Then EC2 instance requires to run continuously. That means running the entire virtual machine, even if, if you have a small task. And then you have to manually adjust resources. If you are going for a vertical scaling, you have to increase the RAM, memory, storage, 
or if you want to go for a horizontal scaling then also you have to configure those auto scaling that means add or remove instances dynamically based on the workload and last but not least we already reviewed you are paying for the reserve instances or on demand instances or spot instances but the summary is you are paying for the ec2 instance let's say if you are not even using in contrast aws lambda it's a virtual function serverless architecture and you are just focusing on writing your application code rather than managing any infrastructure it is entirely managed by aws that is why there is no or minimal user intervention AWS will take care all those management in terms of OS patching, security patching, scalability, high availability, all those aspects for you. Lambda executes as small function in response to specific events. We have already reviewed the event driven architecture and it will automatically scale based on your incoming events. Last but not least, you are paying per invocation and execution time and there is no upfront cost. So these are the side by side comparison between EC2 and the AWS Lambda. As we got little familiarity with AWS Lambda, let's create our first Lambda function. Before taking you to AWS management console, I would like to show you the GitLab repo where I have uploaded all the codes, configurations and the step by step process for you to follow along with me. Since this is not a coding class, we will concentrate only on the Lambda configurations and concepts instead of compiling and debugging Lambda codes. Like all our previous Zero to Hero courses, I will provide the GitLab repo link in the video description. This GitLab repo has every Lambda code samples that we are going to follow today. You can clone the repo and follow the labs with me. I have logged into AWS Management Console and I am at Console Home. Now, to create a Lambda function, we have to go to Lambda Dashboard. If you have accessed AWS Lambda previously, then you can see Lambda in recently visited. If you do not see AWS Lambda here, then don't worry, you can go to search bar and type Lambda. And then click Lambda, it will navigate you to Lambda Dashboard. If you haven't created a Lambda function before, you will land in this Lambda dashboard. In this screen, you will find some Lambda code samples based on different Lambda runtimes, starting with .NET, Java, Node.js, Python, Ruby, and custom runtime. Let's run the sample Python function. I'll click on the run button. Here you go. We have the output as hello from Lambda based on the sample code template AWS has provided. To create our first Lambda function, we'll click on the create a function button. We have three options to create a Lambda function. Either I can author from scratch or I can use AWS provided Lambda blueprint or I can use a container image to run my Lambda. Don't worry, we will use all three options today. But for this demo, I will select author from scratch. I'll use the Lambda function name as CES Lambda Demo. For runtime, there are different runtime options are available and I'll choose Python 3.12. If you are following this video after six months, you may see a different Python version or a higher Python version. Please don't worry, take the higher Python version what is available for you. Today we have 3.12, maybe down the line six months we can have 3.13. So please select whatever the highest version you have. I'll select 3.12. In terms of architecture, I'll keep x86. Then in terms of permission, change the default execution role. Now I have three options. Either I can create a new role with this Lambda function creation, or I can choose an existing roles, or I can create a new role from AWS policy template. I will go with the default option create a new role with basic Lambda permissions and then I'll click create function. It will take 30 seconds for the Lambda function to be created. Here you go. The function has been created. 
and it has written the boilerplate code for lambda in python it is a very simple function it is importing json and then we have a lambda handler and it is returning status code as 200 and then a body hello from lambda let's modify that message to hello from ces demo lambda one point you have to remember the moment you will change your code you must deploy that change or else changes will not be reflected i'll deploy this code and then i'm going to test it for test i can click test and here i can create a test event called test and then it already has some event json i'm going to save it and again i'll click test and this is as simple as that it will give me that status code at 200 and the body is hello from ces demo lambda now i want to drag your attention for one point if you see this line report request id there is a request id then the duration that lambda executed for 8.82 .8 milliseconds you are going to build for 9 millisecond because lambda will provide billing granularity of millisecond it has used memory size of 128 mb and you can see init duration it's 87.95 millisecond so please note down this init duration now next what we are going to do we are going to click the test again for this scenario the execution duration is 1.63 milliseconds and the build duration rounded to nearest milliseconds that is why 2 millisecond however there is no init duration this represents the first lambda invocation requires an initialization time and we call this time as cold start but for any consecutive execution lambda function does not require the initialization time now let's explore some more lambda function configurations now i was in the code tab from there i'll go to configuration tab although we are going to discuss all those execution roles security and permission now for the time being let's go ahead and edit the execution role here you have three options one is the memory now if you want to allocate more memory for your lambda you can increase the memory here by default your lambda has ephemeral storage of 512 mb if you want to increase you can increase in this place by default your lambda timeout is three seconds at any point of time if you have to increase your timeout you can go till 15 minute or 900 seconds so see 15 minute 3 second it is not going to accept it will take till 15 minutes these are the configurations you might need to adjust to your lambda function based on your use case for this demo we are going to keep the default settings so that is why we are going to go to timeout as 3 second and that is enough for me i am going to save in summary in this segment of the demo, we observed four important lambda configurations, build duration, allocated memory, allocated ephemeral storage, and timeout. In the next section, we'll explore how to calculate lambda charges and what are the parameters AWS uses to calculate lambda pricings. Please join me in the next part of the video. In this section, we'll cover the lambda pricing. We'll first cover the Lambda free tiers. AWS Lambda has a very generous free tier. Unlike other AWS services, Lambda free tier are not just for initial 12 months. All the Lambda free tiers are applicable on forever basis. In terms of invocations, AWS Lambda offers 1 million free invocations per month. And in terms of compute time, AWS offers 400,000 GB second free every month. As I mentioned earlier, both the free tiers discount will be available rest of your AWS account life. Coming to Lambda charges. Coming to Lambda charges. First, AWS charges you based on the number of monthly invocations after deducting the 1 million free tier invocations. In terms of compute time, Again, AWS calculates total compute time from all your Lambda functions in that AWS account minus 400,000 GB second free tier every month. Third, AWS charges you based on the amount of ephemeral storage 
consumed by your lambda functions. AWS also charges you for the provision concurrency. I will explain what is provision concurrency in great details. If you are using Lambda for HTTP response streaming, then AWS will charge you for that as well. AWS also charges you for ingress and egress data transfer of your Lambda function from outside the region the function executed. And last but not least, if you are using Lambda function as Lambda at edge, then AWS will charge you for Lambda at edge execution as well. Regular Lambda function has a free tier. However, Lambda at edge does not have a free tier. We will review the Lambda pricing using an example. Let's assume you are building a mobile application for a food ordering restaurant chain. Your application will receive 3 million requests per month. On an average, every request will be processed for 120 milliseconds. And you are using x86 based architecture with 1536 MB of memory. Your function also has 1 GB of ephemeral storage. I have summarized all the parameters from our example in this slide. First, we'll calculate the monthly request charges. For our example, total request is 3 million. If I deduct the 1 million free tier per month, then billable request count will be 2 million. Lambda charges you 20 cent per million of invocation after free tier, which will result 40 cent for the request charges. Now let's calculate the charges for compute time. We had 3 million requests and average execution duration was 120 millisecond. If you multiple these two numbers and convert into second, we will have 360,000 seconds of monthly execution. Our Lambda function was configured with 1.5 GB of memory. If we multiply the execution second with memory, it gives us 540,000 GB seconds of compute charges. Remember, we have 400,000 GB seconds of free tier per month. If we subtract the free tier, the billable compute charge will be 140,000 GB seconds. Based on the AWS compute charges for Lambda, we'll pay $2.33 as Lambda compute charges. Then for monthly ephemeral storage charges, our function used 1 GB of ephemeral storage. AWS does not charge ephemeral storage up to 0.5 GB. For our example, billable ephemeral storage will be 0.5 GB. While calculating monthly compute charges, we have seen Lambda function executed for 360,000 seconds. This gives us monthly ephemeral storage of less than 1 cent or $0.0056. If we combine all the three charges, for my example, monthly Lambda billing will be $2.74. I hope this gives you a clear idea on Lambda pricing calculation and how cost effective Lambda is compared to VM based compute services. Before we proceed further, if you are new to our channel or haven't subscribed yet, then please consider subscribing our channel and please click on the bell icon to get notification for any new topics. Now let's continue with the video. Now let me show you how you can calculate all Lambda billing or pricing and AWS provides a free tool to you. Now let me take you to that free tool. We call it as AWS Calculator. You can go to Google Chrome and in the search bar, please type AWS Calculator. The first link is AWS Pricing Calculator. Now you can create estimate and here in the find service search bar, type AWS Lambda. Configure and let's enter all those parameters we have selected. If you remember, we have used x86 architecture. Number of requests was 3 million per month. Duration was 120 milliseconds. And then amount of memory we have allocated 1536 MB. Amount of ephemeral storage 
we have used 1024 or 1 GB. And now if we go to show calculation, you can see the amount is coming 2.74, whatever we have reviewed in our AWS pricing calculation. And it has all the detailed explanation how it came to $2.74. Now based on your request and response pattern, you can change those values and you can play around with this calculator. If I'll save and view summary, here I can see what is the pricing for Lambda. It will give me the monthly pricing and also the annual pricing. You will be able to play around with this calculator. This is free of cost. You can add whatever the AWS service you need. You will be able to perform a TCO calculation for your AWS infrastructure. In this section, I'm going to talk about Lambda invocations. There are three types of Lambda invocations. Let's review them one by one. We'll start with synchronous invocation, where client will wait for the response. Let's try to understand synchronous invocation with the help of an example. Let's assume API Gateway is the client and invoking Lambda function. API Gateway will initiate the invocation with the HTTP request. Then Lambda will process the request and Lambda will send the response back to API Gateway. In synchronous invocation, the client will wait for the response. If the client does not receive a response within the threshold time, then client can throw a timeout exception. In terms of default behavior, if the Lambda function will execute without an error, it will send HTTP 200. If the Lambda function will face an exception, it will send the exception to the client but Lambda will not retry or reprocess the request. The next invocation type is asynchronous. Unlike synchronous invocation, client will not wait for the response. Let's assume Amazon SNS is invoking AWS Lambda. SNS will first send the HTTP request to Lambda. Before processing the request, Lambda will pass an acknowledgement that the request has been queued Please pay attention to the HTTP response code. Lambda will pass the response code as HTTP 202 irrespective of the processing status. Lambda will then process the request. For asynchronous invocation, processing outcome or status will not be delivered to the client. In terms of default behavior, if the process failed, Lambda will retry two times. That means the request will be processed three times in total first time the original request, then two retries. Lambda will discard the request if the processing is not successful even after two retry. Then there is a third type of invocation called polling invocation. For polling invocation, instead of client is pushing the request, Lambda will poll the client for request. If we go deep inside Lambda, there will be event source mapping which will poll the client continuously, SQS for our case. In response, if there are any message or event, the client will send a batch of event to Lambda. Lambda function will then process the request. In terms of default behavior, for polling invocation, Lambda will keep on retrying until the process completed successfully or data expired. Now let's review the list of AWS services that can invoke Lambda function synchronously, asynchronously, and those that Lambda can pull. To start with synchronous invocation, there is a list of services starting with Lambda API, AWS CLI, AWS SDK, AWS serverless application model or SAM, AWS step function, application load balancer, Amazon Cognito, Amazon API Gateway, Amazon Alexa, Amazon Lex, Amazon CloudFront via Lambda at Edge, Amazon Kinesis Data Firehose and Amazon S3 Batch. So these are the services that can invoke Lambda synchronously. Moving to asynchronous, Amazon S3, Amazon SNS, AWS CloudFormation, Amazon EventBridge, AWS IoT, AWS IoT Event, AWS Code Commit, AWS Code Pipeline, Amazon SES or Simple Email Service, AWS Config and Amazon CloudWatch Log they can invoke Lambda asynchronously. And in these cases, after invoking, they will not wait for the response. 
Now the last category is polling invocation and we have four services, Amazon DynamoDB Stream, Amazon Kinesis, Amazon MSK and Amazon SQS. Now let's go to AWS Management Console and let's see the demo of synchronous invocation versus asynchronous invocation. In both the cases, we are going to use AWS CLI. Now let's review the synchronous and asynchronous invocation first before we go to polling invocation. For this demo, I am going to use lambda invocation.pi, this function code, and I am going to copy this code and I'll create a lambda function. Also, we have one file called lambda invocation payload. Here we have all those commands that you can use to invoke Lambda synchronously and also Lambda asynchronously. So let's use these artifacts and part from the lab together. I am back to AWS Lambda dashboard and this time I'm going to create a new function. I'll click create function. I'll provide the function name as Lambda invocation. I'll use runtime as Python 3.12 and then I'm going to create the function and I'm going to replace the boilerplate code with the function code from my repo. If you pay attention, the last line is raise exception. I'm going to comment this line and I'm going to uncomment the return response body. Okay, now I'm going to deploy this Lambda function first. I am going to test from the Lambda UI. So first I'm going to create a test event. I'll replace that event as course AWS Lambda course series zero to hero. And then I'll save as a test event. And then I'll execute, here you go. So I have the success response. Now let's try to invoke this Lambda function using cloud cell. For that, I'll invoke cloud cell. I'll copy the first command from here. Please replace the function name with the function name you have provided. And then I'm going to paste it. See, we are getting status code as 200 and executed version is latest. That means we are invoking the latest version of the Lambda and we are getting status code as 200. Now let's try to toggle that return statement and forcefully we are going to emit exception. So we are going to comment return statement where it is returning the response body. Rather, we are going to raise some exception and we are going to send the message as sample exception raised from the Lambda code. I'll change that to CES Lambda demo code. Now I'm going to deploy this first. Please remember that you have to deploy this Lambda function or else you won't be able to see that changes. And now let's try to execute the same command again. Here you go. This time you can see that we are getting function as error as unhandled exception. Right. So that means the Lambda is sending us exception here. Now, if I'm going to cat the response, sorry, cat, here you go. Now, if I'll see that response.json, I have sample exception raised from the CES Lambda demo. Error type is exception. And here is the request ID. This is the example of synchronous invocation. That means if the Lambda is returning exception, you will get exception in the response. If Lambda is returning success, you will get success in the response. Now let's try to invoke the same Lambda function asynchronously. Let me go back to my GitLab page. Now try to understand the difference between these two command. For the first command, we have used AWS Lambda invoke with the function name, CLI binary format as raw in 64. But if you review the third command, where we are trying to invoke Lambda asynchronously, here we are specifying the invocation type as event. If you are specifying the invocation type as event, that means you are invoking the Lambda function asynchronously. Now, please change this function name for your case when whatever the function name you are using and then invoke the Lambda function. Let me copy this command. I'll change that Lambda function name and then let's run together. I'll clear the screen. Now I'll first paste that. And currently my Lambda function is raising exception and I'll execute this command. Here you go. 
Okay, maybe I'll clear the screen again and I'll execute the command. I'm getting status code as 202. Here Lambda is not sending any response body. If I'll try to cat the response, what we have done for synchronous invocation, it should not have a response body. Here you go, that is what we are getting. Because for asynchronous invocation, this is acknowledgement, not a response. Now let's fix that Lambda function and instead of raising the exception, let's send the response from there. I'll comment the last line and I'll uncomment the return where we are returning the response body. I'll deploy that change. I'll execute the same command again. This time also, we are getting the status code. That means for asynchronous invocation, it does not matter if the request process successfully or if there is a failure. Lambda will always send a status code 202, that is HTTP 202 or the acknowledgement. So do not get confused with 202 as, the, as a success or as a failure. Let me go back to my PPT again. Before I demo the polling invocation, I would like to talk about one more aspect of Lambda asynchronous invocation, which is Lambda destination. In the previous demo, we saw for asynchronous invocation, Lambda returns HTTP 202 acknowledgement to the client. Now I want to double down inside the Lambda architecture and let's take the previous example where Amazon SNS is invoking Lambda with a HTTP request. Then inside Lambda, there is an internal queue and the Lambda function code. The client invokes Lambda, the request will be added to the internal queue first, then Lambda will send the acknowledgement that the request queued successfully and then Lambda function code will be invoked to process the request. Here are some services that can invoke Lambda asynchronously. We also discussed by default, Lambda retries two times for any failure. For your implementational use case, you may want to capture the failed request for future processing, or you may want to invoke another Lambda function to send acknowledgement or initiate further processing. Generally, we had to write code or invoke destination systems implicitly. But thanks to Lambda destination, we can configure the success and failure both the scenario without writing a single line of code. Lambda supports four destinations, SQS, SNS, Event Bridge, and Lambda. And you just need the ERN of the destination to configure failure versus success. For example, you want to invoke another Lambda function if the first function executed successfully or for failure after two retries, you want to park the failed request to a dead letter queue or to a event bridge. In both the scenario, you need the ARN and configure them as destination. Now let's review the process in AWS Management Console. I'm back to my Lambda console. I'll close the cloud cell and I'm going to use the same Lambda function. This time I'll comment the success return statement and I'll uncomment the exception. I'll go to SQS and I'll create a dead letter queue. And I'm going to send that request or I'm going to send that failed request to the dead letter queue. So I'll create a queue, a standard queue. I'll put Lambda DLQ. Now for configuration, I'll go with all those default value. Encryption settings go with the default value. Access policy also default. And one point I would like to show you the dead letter queue. Again, I am creating this queue as a dead letter queue, but not the dead letter queue of another one queue. That is why for the time being, I'll keep this as disable. When I'll create a dead letter queue for this queue, that means when the, this SQS queue want to send the request to another one dead letter queue, that time you are going to enable. If you are going to enable, you have to give the queue ARN for the other queue. Since I am going to create this queue as a dead letter queue, that is why I am going to disable that one and I'll create the queue. Now I'll take that ARN from here. I'll go to Lambda function, add destination. I am going to add destination here for asynchronous invocation. As I was saying, we have success condition. You can add for on failure and on success. I want to create for on failure. 
from destination type, we have SNS, SQS, Lambda function or event bridge bus that we have seen in the diagram. I'm going to select SQS and I'm going to put the destination ARN or the QARN and I'm going to save. Okay, so now you can see in the Lambda UI, in the visual diagram, I have a connection with this SQS queue. Now if I'll go to test this again, if I'll test it, the execution function succeeded. Okay, maybe I haven't deployed that code. Yes, changes not deployed. That is why it was providing success. So I'll deploy the change first and then I'm going to test it. Since the API will provide the synchronous invocation, that is why you are getting the error message. Now let's go to cloud cell again and we'll try to invoke the Lambda function asynchronously. Here I have the invocation type as event and I'm going to click. I got that status code as 202. Now let's try to monitor the event. For that, I can go to monitor and here are all those invocation metrics. We'll come back to this invocation matrix. We can go to CloudWatch log and we can observe the invocation history over there. So here we can see that error one time. So this is the first time error. Then this is the second time error. Then there should be one more time error because this is the first execution. Then the first retry. So there should be one more retry. Maybe I'll allow it to refresh. Yes, here we can see that we have three retry. So this is the first error message. And then there is a second error message. And then there is a third error message. So Lambda already did two automatic retry. Then we should have one message at the SQS queue. If I refresh SQS. Here you go. It took some time for the message to deliver to this SQS queue. Now we have one message available. If I'll go inside that queue, and if you'll go to send and receive message, here we can see, now we can poll for message. Here is the message. We can see this is the message we have received from in that queue. And here you can see sample exception raised from CS Lambda demo, error type exception, request ID, and all those details. That means this message came from the Lambda function. So when our client will asynchronously invoke Lambda function, it will by default retry two times and then it will send that message if you have any destination. Similarly, if I'll go back to the Lambda function again, and you can add a success destination also. So instead of on failure, if you click on success, and here again, you have four options, SNS, SQS, Lambda function, or event bus. Now let's review the Lambda event source mapping or the Lambda polling invocation. We have reviewed AWS services like Amazon DynamoDB Stream, Amazon Kinesis Data Stream, Amazon Managed Service for Kafka and Amazon SQS. So these are the four services. They are the source of the polling event. Unlike asynchronous and synchronous invocations, for this polling invocation, records must be pulled from the sources they are not going to push that record. For polling invocation, now Lambda is invoked synchronously. Please remember this fact. Polling invocation, Lambda is invoked synchronously. We have already seen this diagram that we have Amazon SQS and we have Lambda that is broken into two parts. We have an event source mapping that is constantly polling the SQS queue. And then once the message is available, it is invoking the Lambda function. And in this case, the SQS will return a batch of events. Input source could be a stream and it could be a queue. If we are using DynamoDB, Kinesis data stream, these are stream. But if you are using Amazon SQS standard or FIFO, this will be the queue data sources. First, we'll go with stream. Now let's replace SQS with Kinesis data stream. Again, this is a polling invocation. And in this case, inputs as stream, that means from Kinesis or DynamoDB. 
So first, here event source mapping creates an iterator. For us, we have the Lambda event source mapping. It will create an iterator for each sort and process item in order at the sort level. If your Kinesis has multiple sorts, then event source mapping will create an iterator for every sort and you will have the data processing in order at the sort level. Then you can start that processing with the new item or from a specific timestamp or from the beginning. Any process item, it won't be removed from the sort or the stream, unlike to queue. Once your Lambda function will process an event, the record will be still there with the stream for other processors to process. And please remember that any process item won't be removed from the SART or stream. And this is exactly opposite in the queue or the SQS. For heavy traffic cases, you can process records in batches, up to 10 batches per SART. If I'll explain with an example, let's say you have a SART where you have different records. So now you are processing based on the batch and it will invoke multiple Lambda functions. Coming back to the record ordering for batch processing also, records will records order is guaranteed, but at the partition key level. Now you can see in this diagram, we have three different partitions, one with the green color, one is the red color and one is the blue color. And based on those partitions, it's segregated into three different batches and Lambda is processing those batches parallelly and ordering will be maintained at the partition level. Now let's review the error handling for the batch. Unlike to the asynchronous invocation where Lambda tried two times and after that it's stopped trying or it is sending to a DLQ, here the error in the batch can hold the processing for that particular sort. Because Lambda will keep on trying if your function returns an error while processing a record, the entire batch will be reprocessed until the processing completes successfully. So it will keep on retrying, retrying and retrying. You must implement some solutions such that your processing will not be stalled if there is any exception. And you have options like you can limit the number of retries like asynchronous invocation, you can configure, maybe it will stop after three retries, or you can reduce the batch size. Maybe if Lambda is getting failed because of the timeout, you can maybe half or split the batches into multiple. You can configure the batch element size, and also you can set a destination to discard the fail event, like what we did for the asynchronous invocation. Now let's review the input as Q, that means SQS standard and SQS FIFO Q. Again, the diagram is same for us. We have an event source mapping. And in this case also, it will return a batch. We can configure the batch size. We'll see when we'll do in SQS, we can configure the batch size. And in this case, we can keep that message count from one to 10 for a FIFO Q and one to 10,000 for SQS standard and you will be able to configure that batch size. Then Lambda event source mapping will use long polling to invoke the SQS queue and any process item will be removed from the queue. This is exactly opposite what we have reviewed for the stream. For this purpose, AWS recommend that you should set the queue visibility timeout six times the Lambda timeout. Since Lambda will process that request and after that it will remove from the queue. That is why you should set the queue visibility as six times the Lambda timeout, whatever you have set. If for input as a queue error handling, for SQS standard, batches are returned to the queue as individual item and it will process in a different group. That means the same record can be processed more than one time. That is why you should create an item potent Lambda function. Whenever you are processing a queue, your Lambda function should be item potent. Now for the fail record, you can set a DLQ. And if you remember that while creating that SQS queue, I have already shown you that for a particular queue, you can configure another one SQS queue as dead letter queue. You have to do the exact same thing for this case. Because if you want to use the Lambda destination or if you want to use the Lambda DLQ, that is for the asynchronous invocation. You have to set the DLQ at the SQS queue level. 
Now let's go to AWS Management Console again and let's see the demo. And this time we are going to use SQS to invoke Lambda function. I am back to my AWS Management Console and this time we are going to create a new Lambda function. Now this will be a very simple Lambda function. That is why we do not have a sample code here. We'll directly create function. I'll use the name as SQS invoke Lambda. I'll choose the runtime as Python 3.12. I'll keep everything as default and I'll create the Lambda function. Okay. Now I'll go to the Lambda code. I'll use the template code and maybe here I am going to add a print statement. Print the message. Hello from SQS invoke Lambda function demo. I'll deploy this Lambda code and I'll go back to the top of the screen in the designer screen and then I'm going to add a trigger. And from here, I'll select source as SQS. Now you have all different options that you can use for the Lambda invocations. You can see that we have APIs, we have batch. So if I type SQS, now I have to provide the queue, but uh, let's create a queue first. Maybe I'll go to SQS queue and I'm going to create a new queue. I'll create a standard queue. I'll provide the name as Lambda Invoker. Visibility 30 minutes. I'm fine with that. I'll go with all those default options and I'll create queue. Okay. The queue has been created. I'll copy the ARN and I'll go back to my Lambda function. And here I'm going to refresh this queue. The queue name is visible here. I'll select the Lambda Invoker. And here is the batch size. If you remember, we are talking about the maximum batch size. For standard queue, you can put up to 10,000. And for FIFO queue, you can use up to 10. I'll go with the 10. Now, all other thing I'll keep as is and I'll add. Now, the error message is the execution role does not have permission to call the receive message SQS. The reason is because I do my Lambda function does not have permission. So I'll quickly go ahead and modify the Lambda function role. I'll go to Lambda function. I'll use this role. I'll go to IAM. I will add permission, attach policy. I'll type SQS and I will select Amazon SQS full access. For this demo, I don't want to spend time in identifying the exact IAM permission required, but for your implementational use case, please use principle of least privileges and assign the permission that is absolutely required. Now I'll go to Lambda add target page and I'll click add. Okay. Now the SQS has been added as the invoker to this Lambda function. I'll go back to that SQS. Here is the SQS queue, Lambda Invoker, and then I'm going to send a message to this queue. This is a test message. I don't want any delivery delay. I want now and I'll send. Your message has been sent and it's ready to receive. Now, if I'll go back to that queue dashboard, and if I'll refresh, you see the Lambda Invoker message is not available. That means the message is already taken by the Lambda function. Now, if I'll go to the Lambda function, SQS Invoker, and if I'll go to Monitor section, although those dashboards, it will take some time, let's go to CloudWatch log, and hopefully we should see some kind of execution log here. Okay, the log stream is already created, and Hello from the SQS Lambda invocation. So our Lambda function has been successfully invoked by the message in the SQS queue. That means Lambda pulled that message and Lambda executed successfully. For this testing, we can do one more time. We can go to that Lambda invoker and we can send and receive message. Maybe I'll give again test message. I'll send that message. It should invoke the Lambda function. You can see here. So for the second time, again, the Lambda function invoked. Now I hope that you understand the difference between synchronous invocation, asynchronous invocation, and polling invocation. In this section, I am going to talk about Lambda security and permissions. While demoing the Lambda event source mapping, we saw that when we are trying to add Amazon SQS as the invocation point for the AWS Lambda, 
there was some exception because the lambda function does not have the proper security privileges. Now let's understand what are the permissions or what are the different type of rules that is required for lambda function to work. To start with lambda execution rule. Now lambda execution rule, it's an IAM rule that grant lambda function the permission to access AWS services and resources. Let's assume you have a Lambda function and you want to write execution logs to Amazon CloudWatch or write data to Amazon DynamoDB. Your Lambda execution role should have explicit permissions to perform the operation. And the Lambda execution role should be attached with the Lambda function. If any one is missing, then AWS Lambda won't be able to access that AWS resource or service. This privilege was for Lambda to access other services. How about if other AWS services want to access AWS Lambda? Do you need a special permission there? The answer is yes. For that, we have Lambda resource-based policy. Lambda resource-based policy is an IAM policy that grant other AWS services permission to invoke AWS Lambda. Resource-based policy should be attached with the Lambda function that we are trying to invoke. Let's assume we have an Amazon S3 bucket and we want to invoke Lambda asynchronously for S3 object creation event. Unless the Lambda resource-based policy explicitly grant permission to Amazon S3, S3 won't be able to invoke Lambda. To summarize, Lambda execution role gives permission to Lambda function Whereas, resource-based policy gives privilege for other function to access AWS Lambda. Now, let's see these permissions in action. And for this demo, we will use S3 event notification to invoke AWS Lambda. I am back to my AWS management console. Maybe I will close these extra tabs. I will go to AWS Lambda dashboard first. And then, let me go to the GitLab. We are going to use S3 event notification Lambda function. Let's copy this code and let's try to create our event notification function. So I'll create a function and I'll use S3 event notification. I'll choose the runtime as 3.12. I'll keep all other settings as default and then I'm going to create a function. Now I'm going to replace this boilerplate code and I'll deploy. Now, if I'll go to the configuration section, the first permission is execution role. If I'll expand, execution role has permission for Amazon CloudWatch log. If I'll scroll bottom of the page, we have resource-based policy section. Currently, this Lambda function does not have any resource-based policy. Let's go to Amazon S3 and configure S3 invocation. We have one existing bucket, Cloud Expert Solution. I'll go inside that bucket. It's empty bucket. Now I'll go to the properties and I'll come at the bottom of the page where I have event notification. Now I'm going to create an event notification. I'll provide the event name as S3 Invoke Lambda. And I don't want to provide any prefix, suffix. That means for each and every object, Whenever there will be an object created inside the bucket, it should invoke the Lambda function. Now, in terms of event type, you can provide all object creation event or you can specifically put post whatever. For this demo, I am going to give all object creation. And now the destination. Here we have the destination and Lambda function. Now we are going to choose the function as S3 event notification. And then we are going to save the changes. Now you can see here that S3 invoke Lambda, that Lambda function is already associated with this S3 bucket as the S3 notification. Now if I will go back to Lambda function and if I will refresh this page, I will go to the resource based policy. Here you can see one new resource based policy has been added because of the S3 event notification. If I will open that, and we are providing Cloud Expert Solution S3 bucket access to this Lambda function. We'll close. I'll try to upload an object to this bucket. I'll close this pop-up. I'll go inside that bucket. And I'll upload something. 
I'll upload one image file here. I have an image file and I'm going to upload that image file. Now the image file has been uploaded successfully. I can close this. I can see that image file. It is there in my S3 bucket. Now if I'll go to my Lambda function, if I'll go to monitor, it will take some time for the invocation statistics to be refreshed in this matrix or in CloudWatch log. Based on my past experiences, sometimes it may take a minute or more for the invocation details to appear on the dashboard or in the logs. I will pause the video here and refresh the page. I'll come back once the invocation details are reflected. It took more than a minute to refresh. I'll go inside the log stream to review the log statements. Here you go. I can see the file name demopicture.png and the bucket name is Cloud Expert Solution. Let's go to S3 bucket and tally the bucket name and the object name. Yes, in S3 bucket dashboard, my bucket name and the object name matches with CloudWatch log. This represents my Lambda function has been successfully invoked by the S3 object notification. For this demo, I have uploaded an object to my S3 bucket and the object creation event invoke the Lambda function. Now you can add your own logic, maybe create a thumbnail from that image, send an email to user or whatever you want. In this section, we are going to talk about Lambda environmental variables. Now, Lambda environmental variables are key value pair. Now, why you need environmental variable? Let's try to understand that first. Maybe you want to implement a dynamic configuration. That means you want to use different database endpoints, API keys based on your environment. Then instead of hard coding those parameters inside your Lambda function or using multiple Lambda functions, you can use environmental variables. Next is version specific configuration. You can define environmental variable on the unpublished version of your function. And when you will publish a version, these variables will be locked in that specific version. The third use case could be sensitive information management. Instead of hard coding the secrets like database credentials or API keys, you can store them as environmental variables. On top of that, you can encrypt those environmental variables using AWS CMK or your own custom CMK. Now let's go to AWS Management Console and let's see the demo. I'll go to Lambda and I'll create a function and this time I'll author from scratch. Now let me go to my GitLab repo. This time I'm going to go inside Lambda environmental variables. There we have two code, one for the encrypted and one for the plain text. So first let's demo the plain text one. I'll copy the code and I'll put here Lambda envvar. For the runtime, I'll select Python 3.12. And here I am going to use an, an existing role and I'll use Lambda Canary demo. This execution role I have from a previous demo. I'm going to use this execution role because it has all those privileges. I'll create a function. I'll first replace the existing code and then I'll deploy. Now let me explain a little. To access the environmental variable, we have to import the OS package. And using that waste package, there is a function called waste get env with the environmental variable name. So whatever the environmental variable with this name, it will retrieve. So let me copy and quickly create an environmental variable. I'll go to configuration and from the left hand side panel, I'll select environmental variable. I'll edit, add a new environmental variable. The key I'll use as env var and the value I'll give test env value and I'll save. I'm using a plain text that is why I'm not encrypting any text here. Okay, so I have that env var with a value. Now I'll go back to my lambda function and I'm going to test it. First I'm going to create a test event and it will print the variable value. Now I'll test. Here you go. This is the test env value. By this way, you will be able to store and retrieve plain text Lambda environment variables. But if you want to store database credentials or API keys, then you should use encrypted environment variables, not the plain text version. Now let's review the encrypted Lambda environment variables. 
for that i'll first go to kms and i'll create a key first i'll go to customer manage key i'll create a symmetric key and then i'll give the key alias as lambda demo key description is optional tag is optional i'll go to next and from here i'll provide the administrator as lambda canary demo because this is the role i am using if you remember and also i'll select lambda canary demo for the key uses permission next so this is the kms policy i have i'll finish here i have a lambda demo key i'll come back to the lambda dashboard again i'll go to configuration i'll edit the environmental variable i'll remove this existing environmental variable i'll go to gitlab and now i'll copy this code from the lambda environment encrypted i'll come to this lambda function i'll say because i have removed the plain text one i'll come to code and now i am going to replace this existing code with a new code now first deploy and now let me explain what is there in this code so here we have used boto3 now boto3 is a python library that help us to access all other aws services i have used os package because i want to access that environmental variable here is the lambda handler where i am getting that encrypted value os.getenv so this should not be or something new to you because we have already did that for the plain text one and after that we are decrypting that environmental variable what we are getting now in the decrypt function inside that we are accessing the boto client and we are creating a client for the kms and then we are going to invoke that kms key and we are going to decrypt the encrypted kms value and then we will return the decrypted key value then we will capture that decrypted value in the lambda handler and then we are going to print that for this example the environmental variable name is envvar i'll copy this i'll go to configuration i'll create another one environmental variable i'll add environmental variable and this time i'll go to encryption configuration i'll use enable encryption and then i'll put the key and value as this is a test now you can use default aws lambda or you can use customer key since i am going to use customer key i'll select the key whatever we have created and then once i have selected that key i am going to encrypt it i am going to select lambda demo key encrypt okay so this is the encrypted value that we have saved here and i'll save this now i have one environmental variable with encrypted value now i'll go to my lambda function i'll go to code and i'm going to test that function here you go this is the test so now we can see maybe what we can do we can print the encrypted val value also now let's print the encrypted value and the decrypted value both together i'll deploy and i'll test here you go this is the first one which has the encrypted key value and then this is the test this is the decrypted one so by this way you will be able to use lambda environmental variables to store all those secrets you can use both plain text you can use encrypted and here is the sample code i have given you can use the sample code for your enterprise use case also now if you are following with me and if you have created a kms custom key now kms custom key is not free that is chargeable that is let's remove that key such that you will get only a very very minimal charges so we can select that key we can go to key action and we can schedule deletion please remember that if you will disable that key then also aws will charge you so no matter the key status if it's a enable disable aws will charge you it's best practice to delete if you are not using any key you don't have to remove this lambda function if you are not invoking you are not going to pay so let's have that lambda function so far we have used only sample lambda functions and only import the runtime libraries like boto3 os json 
but in your real life implementational use case you will find most of the time you need to import external dependencies with your lambda code for example you may have to connect to mysql database or ms sql database then you must install those packages with your lambda code and zip together in this section of the code we'll see how we can import external dependencies with lambda function but before that let's try to understand what is external dependencies and how it work if you are using any dependencies or library that is not available in the aws lambda environment you must pack that as a zip file and you must upload that with your lambda code now the question is how to include external dependencies with lambda code if you are using java then include the relevant dot jar files if you are using node js then use npm and the node module directory with your lambda code and if you are using python then you have to use pip and then dash dash target option you need to package all the dependencies as zip file with the lambda code then you have to upload the zip file now if it is less than 50 mb you can directly upload to lambda function but if your zip file is more than 50 mb you can upload to s3 bucket and then reference the s3 path from the lambda function if you are using native libraries then you must compile them on amazon linux now for this demo i am going to demonstrate you how you can use python external libraries as dependencies and i believe most of the time you will have external dependencies more than 50 mb because directly uploading to lambda is very easy i'll show you but for this demo i am going to use the difficult option that means we'll first upload into s3 bucket and then we are going to reference the s3 path from the lambda now let's go to aws management console and see that in action i am back to aws management console and this time i am not going to create a function from here rather i am going to use cloud cell while cloud cell is initiating let me take you to gitlab in our gitlab repo if you go to the top level then you can see lambda external dependencies and inside that we have two component one is the lambda function py that means this is the lambda function and then we have one deployment steps so we are going to follow these deployment steps one by one now let's go back to lambda function yes our cloud cell is ready first i'll create a directory let me check my current path yes i am under my home directory i'll first create a directory and i'll use that name as lambda dependencies now i'll go inside the directory next i'm going to create the lambda function and i'm going to use the name as lambda function py okay i'm going to copy this python function code from here to that editor now we have to indent that since this is a python code you should indent this before saving so let me indent this first i have fixed the indentation then i am going to save this i have created my lambda function now before continuing further that first i'll create the lambda function using lambda console and i'll show you the problem that we are facing i will use the lambda function name as lambda function and then the runtime is python 3.12 i'll change the execution role and this time i'll put the execution role as lambda canary demo and i'll create the function now i'll copy the code from here i'll directly replace the template code with this code and i'll deploy now for this function we have used import request we are using request package and this request package is not available by default with lambda that is why when i'll try to execute that code lambda will throw exception so let's try to test i'll put the event name as test save and if i'll test it will say unable to import module request that means this module is not available that is why it is throwing me runtime import module error that is what we are going to fix here and we are going to upload all those dependencies or packages that is required with this request i am back to my cloud cell and now here what we are trying to do we are trying to install request package 
I'll go outside this folder to the root directory. So I'll use cd dot dot. And now I am outside this Lambda dependency. I'll use pip three install dash dash target equal to Lambda dependencies. And the package name is requests. So this command is going to download the dependencies. Here we are getting some error. You can ignore this is for the library conflict. That's absolutely fine. I'll go inside the folder again. And I'll try to check what are the files downloaded. Yes, I can see that I have all those packages along with requests. So I'm good here. The next step is I have to zip all those libraries and dependencies together with that function code in a zip file. I want to pack everything. That is why I will use recursive minus R and I'll put outside the folder. That is why I'll use lambda deployment zip. This will be the name of my zip file lambda deployment zip and I am going to put in the root directory and taking everything from the current directory. So now it zipped everything and put here. So now if I'll go back to the root directory and if I'll put ls, I can see I have the lambda dependencies and the lambda deployment zip. Now the next would be I want to upload this zip packet to S3 bucket such that I'll be able to use that S3 location for creating the Lambda function. I'll use the command AWS S3 CP and then I am under home directory. So maybe I'll check my current location. I'll use AWS S3 CP. I'll provide the URL of the current directory. And then the location where I want to upload, I'll go to my S3 bucket. Here is my S3 bucket. So I'll copy this bucket name here, Cloud Expert Solution. And I'll come back again. Here I'm going to put S3 colon and my bucket name. Okay. Now it is going to upload that zip file to my S3 location. If I go to S3 object and if I refresh, here you go. I have the Lambda deployment zip. Now I'll go to Lambda function and I'll use the previous Lambda function where I have that code which was not running. If I'll test here, it is saying the runtime import module, I'll upload here. Now, as I was saying that you have two options, either you can directly upload the zip file. Once you created that zip file, you can directly upload from here using the dot zip file and you can upload. Or the second option is you can upload from S3 location. And I'm going to use in S3 location because most of the time your dependencies will be more than 50 MB and you have to follow this step. Now I need the S3 URL, I'll again go back to S3 and I'll go to this Lambda deployment zip and I'll copy this object URL and I'll paste this object URL and save. Now you can see this time this Lambda function has with all those external dependencies including the request. I'll deploy that code. Now let me execute. Hopefully this time you should not throw any exception. Yes. Now I can see the success code. What I have done inside that Lambda function, I have used request package and I'm trying to ping google.com. That is what I'm trying to get request.getgoogle.com. Whatever the response I'm getting, I'm going to print that response or sending that response in the body. And in the execution result, I found that it was able to successfully ping the google.com and this is the body. So now my Lambda function has all those external dependencies that it's required to execute that code. Now, before I go away, let me show you one more thing. So let me copy this code and create one more Lambda function. For this Lambda function, we have those external dependencies. Now let's go back to Lambda function dashboard, create one more Lambda function and this time, I'll use the name as demo lambda. I'll put the runtime as Python and I'll use the same execution role, lambda canary demo and create function. I'll replace the code 
and I'll deploy that code. Now I'll open the other Lambda function side by side. This is the previous Lambda function, which has all those dependencies. And this is the new Lambda function, which does not have a dependency. Now I have uploaded all those external dependencies as part of the previous Lambda function. This Lambda function does not have, and I'm running from the same account. Now, if I'll try to test, I will see the same exception, unable to import the module. That means whatever the dependencies I have uploaded, that is local to that Lambda. And that is the big problem here. If you are using this method to create and zip everything and uploading all those functions along with this Lambda code, you have to do for each and every Lambda function. Let's try to understand what solution we have to overcome this problem. The solution is Lambda layer. We have seen this demo that we have function one and function two, and we have uploaded the code dependencies for function two. When you are trying to execute that function two, it was executing properly because of the dependency, whereas the function one, it was not executing properly. To execute it properly, we have to again part from the same step. We have to upload all those dependencies for function one, then only it will execute. So in this approach, we found dedicated code dependencies, custom runtimes, configuration files required at the Lambda function level. And the other problem we also discussed that we can't directly upload a zip package if it's more than 50 MB. Then the solution is Lambda layer. Still, we have two functions. Now, instead of uploading the individual dependencies function-wise, we can create a Lambda layer. In that Lambda layer, we can upload all those dependencies, custom runtimes, configuration files, everything, and then can tag those Lambda layer with the specific function. When you are associating that Lambda function with that particular Lambda layer, that Lambda layer will have all those codes and dependencies and by that way, we'll be able to attach up to five Lambda layers for each and every function. And that's eliminate that function level, all those zip file or all those additional spaces when we are uploading that custom runtime. So Lambda layer eliminates that previous problem, whatever we have discussed. Now let's go to AWS Management Console and let's see that. For this demo, we are going to use Pandas library now Pandas is a open source Python library for data analytics and data manipulation. And I believe for your organizational use case, since data analytics is a very hot topic, everyone is using data analytics for the data frame and all. That is why I have used Pandas libraries for my next demo. Let's go back to AWS Management Console and continue there. I am back to my AWS Management Console and I'll go to our GitLab repo. And here you can see I have one folder called Lambda Layer Pandas. I'll open this Lambda Layers and I'll copy this code. I'll go to my Lambda function. I'm going to create one and I'm going to name that function name as Lambda Layer. I'm going to select the runtime as Python 3.12. I'll go to the execution role. I'll use an existing execution role and I'm going to use the previous role here. I'll create the function and I'm going to replace the code. I'm going to deploy the code. If we try to understand this code, I have the JSON import and then I am importing Pandas dependency. Panda is an open source library for data analytics and data manipulation. That is why I have created a data frame here. Now here I have used pd.dataframe, the Pandas library method. I have used some test data here and then I'm doing some kind of data manipulation. Then I'm going to print the data frame. And at the end, I have converted the data frame to a JSON object and I'm returning the JSON data here. Now, if I'll try to test that, I won't be able to execute this because I do not have pandas in my Lambda runtime. I'll test unable to import module pandas. This time we are not going to follow the previous step. We are not going to pack everything in a zip file and we are not going to upload. But this time I'll go at the bottom of my screen and then I have a separate section called layer. I'm going to add a layer 
And then I have three options. Either I can go with the AWS layer. AWS provided some specific layer I can use from here or the custom layer. Custom layer is the same thing the way we have created the zip file. I can create that zip file and then from there I can choose. So if I select the custom layer before that I can create a new layer for custom layer. I can provide the name, I can provide the description, I can upload the zip file or I can upload the file from S3 bucket, whatever we have done for the Lambda function instead of directly uploading into Lambda function, this time we will upload as a layer. And accordingly, we can use that layer for all other functions. So I am not going to do since I have already done. This time I am going to use and from here I am going to choose the pandas. I am going to use this AWS pandas python 312. So I am going to use this layer and I am going to select the latest version version 3. Then I am going to add. AWS has already created those layers. Now you can see for other lambda functions this lambda layer was 0. Here I have one lambda layer. Now if I will try to execute that code if I'll test now, I should see some execution result. Here you go. So I have that response. I was able to utilize the pandas library and I was able to convert the data frame successfully. So you have two options. Either you can use external dependencies, upload the zip file or you can use layer. And my recommendation would be to use the layers instead of using zip file. In this section, I'm going to talk about Lambda versions and Lambda aliases. So let's start with Lambda version. When we were executing the code multiple times, we have seen that response is coming from the latest version. Till this time, we were working in the latest version and which was a mutable version. That is why we were able to update that code and test, update and test. But when you will publish a particular Lambda version, that will become immutable. And let's say if you have the latest version and if you are happy with that code and if you publish that version, it will create the version one. That version number, it will create incrementally based on your published history. And that time it will become a immutable. You won't be able to edit anything on version one code. If you have to change anything, again, you have to go to latest version. There, do the update, do the testing. If you are happy, you can create the second Lambda version. That is the V2. From here, code, configuration, runtime, environmental variable, everything will come together to create a Lambda version. And once you publish that version, nothing can be changed in a public version. You cannot change the code. You cannot change configuration, runtime or environmental variable. Everything is immutable here. Now each Lambda version, it can be accessed independently and we will have a dedicated ERN for each Lambda version. If I'll compare with our conventional EC2 systems where you are maintaining development, non-prod and prod. Now when users are coming, they have a dedicated URL for prod, non-prod and development versions. Now let's try to understand how we can maintain different regions or different versions of Lambda function. Let's say we have our user and in this time we are going to use Lambda alias. Lambda alias are pointers to specific Lambda versions and you have to remember one thing, although versions are immutable, aliases are mutable. So if I'll compare that EC2 scenario with Lambda, let's say here we have all those Lambda functions the latest version that is mutable, then we have V2 and we have V1. Now V1 is the most stable version and V2 maybe it is in the staging where user is trying to test. Now we have created three Lambda aliases, one for the dev, one for the stage and one for the production. Now what we can do, we can tag all those aliases and we can publish those aliases with the help of the aliases, user can independently work on different Lambda versions. Now let's say you want to deploy to a production. Let's say you have that version V2 and you want to promote that to production. That is what, what you are going to do. You can connect your prod alias with both the version and then you can perform a canary deployment. In that canary deployment, you can split the traffic. Maybe 10% of the traffic, it will go to the new version, version V2 and the 90% of the traffic it will be there in the actual production version. 
Now, in this case, what we are trying to do, we are trying to test that new function with the help of actual production traffic instead of exposing that lambda function directly to production. A portion of the production traffic we are using for the deployment. Now, once you find that everything is fine, that V2 is working as expected as per the requirement, that time you can switch all those traffics from V1 to V2 and you can promote V2 as your production lambda function. One point you have to remember, you can only attach alias with lambda function versions. You can attach multiple versions with one alias. However, you cannot refer one alias from another alias. That means I cannot refer prod alias from the stage alias, but I can attach V1 and V2 version with prod alias. Now let's try to see that in demo. For this demo, I'm going to create a function. I'll use the name as lambda version. I'll put the runtime as 3.12. I'll use the default execution role and I'll create a function. Okay, my function is created. I'll add a print statement. I'll deploy and I'll test. Okay, here you can see this is from Lambda version one. Maybe I'll change that body also. Uh, let's copy this message and let's put in the body as well. Now let's test again. Yes, this is from Lambda version one. Now let's assume I am happy with that version, whatever the code I have done, I am going to publish this version. So for that, I'll go to action, publish new version. Version description optional, I'll publish. Now you can see I have version one that is attached with this Lambda function. So I have published one version. It is saying you can only edit your function code or upload new zip file from the unpublished function page. That means once that function has published, I won't be able to modify anything. This is become immutable. So for that, I'll go to again function and I'll select the Lambda version. Now you can see here, no version is attached. That means this is my latest. If I'll try to test here, the version is latest here. Now let's say this is my second version. I need some modifications. I have modified it to version two. I'll deploy and I'll test. This time I'm getting this is from Lambda version two and still this is latest. I'm happy with this change. And now I'm going to create another one version. This time it should be version V2. Here you go. This is version V2. Now, since I have published, I won't be able to modify this. I'll go back to again Lambda version. And if I'll go to versions, here you can see I have two versions that I have created here. Now next, let's try to create aliases and let's try to attach that Lambda versions. Now I'll go to alias. I'll create alias. First, I'll give the name. Maybe it's a dev alias description. I don't need. And I'll assign latest as the dev. I'll save. So I have this latest version. Again, I'll go back to my Lambda version. Now this time, if I'll go to alias, I have one alias. I'll create two more. One would be prod. And this time I'll put version one. This is the most stable version. I'll again go back to version, aliases, I'll create alias, and this time I'm going to use stage, and I'm going to use version v2. So if I'll go to my Lambda function, I can see I have two versions, version one, version two, and latest is not coming here because that is not published, and I have three aliases. Now I can go to the prod alias, and I can test. If I'll test, it is giving me, this is from Lambda version V1. Similarly, I can go to alias stage and I can test. This is giving me Lambda V2. Now let's say I want to promote V2 as production. In that case, I'll again go back to my aliases. I'll go to the prod and I'll edit that. 
And you can see I have one option for the weighted alias. Now what I'm going to do, I have version one, I'm going to add version two. And then when I'm having two versions, then I have the option to select weighted one. Ideally, what you are going to do, you are going to maybe put 5% of the initial traffic into the new version and 95% on the old version. But since I want to demo you, then I won't be able to use this distribution. And for this demo, I'm going to use 50%. All the traffic, 50% will go to version V1 and 50% will go to version V2. Now I'll save. Now if I'll go to test, I can see first it is coming from V2. Again, I'll test. Now it is coming from V1. This time it is coming from V2. You can play around with the traffic distribution and the weighted percentages. By this way, you can attach multiple Lambda versions with one Lambda alias and perform a canary deployment. Using canary deployment, you can use a subset of the production traffic to test your Lambda function version before promoting as production. In this section, we'll review Lambda concurrency. By default, AWS provides 1000 concurrent Lambda execution limit for Lambda functions in your account in one AWS region. For any invocation request beyond the 1000 concurrent limit will be throttled and Lambda will throw a throttling exception. This is a soft limit and you can request for quota increase if you need to. Let's understand the Lambda concurrency concept using an example. My Lambda function is getting one invocation, one Lambda will be used, another one invocation, another one Lambda will be used, another two invocations. Lambda instance count will be automatically increased based on the request. Now let's assume suddenly your application is getting a big request chunk. To accommodate the request, Lambda will automatically scale up to 1000 invocations per second. This seems absolutely fine and that is what we expect, right? The problem will appear when you have another one Lambda function in your account since the quota is per account per region and if your first Lambda function uses all the invocations, then the other function will starve. Let's try to understand using a real life example. Let's say our application has module like product search, promo code generation, product checkout, and you have backend Lambda functions for each module. Currently, you are running a promotion and as part of that, product search module is getting used heavily. This module is consuming all the concurrent execution quotas. As a result, product code and checkout modules are throwing throttling exceptions and returning HTTP 4 to 9 error code. If the request is synchronous, Lambda will return HTTP 4 to 9. And for asynchronous Lambda invocation, Lambda will auto retry two times, then the request will be either discarded or it will be sent to a DLQ. Then what are the options do we have to prevent this scenario? The first alternative is you can create a service request to AWS for Lambda concurrency quota increase, but that may not guarantee a solution. The other option is Lambda concurrency. You can set a concurrency limit at the function level and limit the concurrent execution for that function. For our example, we can set product search concurrency as 500. That means, Product search Lambda will scale up to 500 concurrent executions, keeping room for other functions to execute simultaneously. This is called reserve concurrency. You can set reserve concurrency for any function from 1 to 900 because AWS mandates us to maintain a minimum unreserved concurrency as 100 per account per region. Next, I can assign 300 reserve concurrency for the promo code Lambda function, which will give us up to 100 execution to be assigned as reserve concurrency for checkout module. If you set reserve concurrency as zero for any Lambda function, it will always throttle. Then there is one more concurrency called provision concurrency. If you remember, during our first Lambda execution demo, 
we had any duration at the execution log which was not available for consecutive executions and we mentioned cold start. This is true for any new lambda instances. It takes initial processing time for the first request. If your application is latency sensitive and cannot sustain lambda cold start, then we can pre-warm the lambda instance using provision concurrency. Whatever the number will set for provision concurrency, that many lambda instances will be pre-initialized or pre-warm and you won't have the cold start. To summarize, provision concurrency to eliminate cold start whereas reserve concurrency to define and limit the concurrent execution of a lambda function. Now let's go and see that in demo. I'm back to my lambda console and for this case, I'll use any existing lambda function. Maybe I'll use the demo lambda. I'll go to configuration. From the left hand side, I'll go to concurrency. Now here you can see that I have two options. One is the concurrency and one is the provision concurrency configuration. Now if I'll go to edit and I can use reserve concurrency or I can use unreserved account concurrency. Currently I have 10 unreserved account concurrency. I'll go to reserve concurrency and if I'll select zero, it will always throttle. So let's select zero and let's try to test rate exceeded. It will always give 4 to 9 or rate exceeded exception. So it will always throttle. Let's again go back and let's go to concurrency. Now, since I do not have that setup, that where I can show you that concurrent executions, but in your case, if you want to change that reserve concurrency, you will put the value here. I'll use the unreserved concurrency. I'll go ahead and save that unreserved concurrency. And I'll move to the provision concurrent execution. Now, if I'll add that configuration, I have option to either select an alias or a version. Now for this demo lambda, I don't think so I have any alias or version. Yes, I don't have a version or I don't have an alias. Maybe I'll select the other lambda. I'll go to function and from there I'll select the lambda version. For this lambda function, I have aliases and version. I'll be able to show you the concurrency setup. For the provision concurrency, I can add configuration. I can select version and here I can select one. To set the provision concurrency, you must assign the concurrency number. That means number of lambda instances for the selected lambda version or alias. Without that, you will get the error like this. In this account, I have zero provision concurrency available. Let me explain the concept from a different account where I have provision concurrency available. Configuring provision concurrency for a function has an impact on the concurrency pool available to other functions. For instance, if you configure 100 units of provision concurrency for function 1, other functions in your account must share the remaining 900 units of concurrency. This is true even if function 1 does not use all 100 units. You can configure up to the unreserved account concurrency in your account minus 100. The remaining 100 units of concurrency are for functions that are not using reserve concurrency. If I try to assign 1000, it won't accept as I have to maintain 100 as unreserved concurrency. I'll not update any settings for this account, but I think you got the concept. Please assign the value based on your use case and I'll cancel out and go out of the Lambda concurrency screen. In this section, I am going to talk about the Lambda monitoring and observability. So first let's review what are the different ways we can monitor a Lambda function. First, we can monitor metrics from Lambda console or CloudWatch. And what are the metrics that is available? We have invocation, duration, error count and success rate. Then we have throttles, total concurrent executions, and recursive invocations dropped. Then we have async eventage, async event received, and async event dropped. And last but not least, we have async delivery failure and iterator edge. Next, we can see all those execution logs that we have already seen during the other sections 
we can see those logs from CloudWatch logs. Here we can see all those Lambda logs for recent invocations. Also, we can see Lambda logs for most expensive invocations in GB second. And the third option is service map. Let's say your organization has a microservice architecture which has multiple distributed components. Now, one of the service is not performing well. It's very difficult to understand from where that error is coming. In that case, a service trace or a service map is helpful. You can use service map with the help of X-ray and you will be able to see the Lambda traces with the help of X-ray. What you have to do, you have to enable in the Lambda configuration. Once you enable, you will see some traces like this. When you will enable X-ray in the Lambda configuration, now AWS Lambda will run the X-ray demand for you. Also, you can use AWS X-ray in your Lambda code. AWS Lambda execution role should have correct IAM permission to access CloudWatch and X-ray. If you want to use CloudWatch and X-ray, then you should have the permission. Then what are the permission it is required? For X-ray, you should have X-ray put trace segment and X-ray put telemetry records. For CloudWatch, you should have log creator log stream, log put log event, and logs create a log group, you should have allow for all those permissions. Let's go to AWS Management Console and see that. I am in my Lambda dashboard. Now let's take any one Lambda. Maybe I'll take the Lambda version. And if I'll go to monitor section, here I have all those metrics. You can see I have invocation, duration, error count, and based on my executions, I have different graphs. So I can see all those metrics from Lambda. Also, I can go to CloudWatch and see those metrics. Now, if you want to see the execution log, you can come at the bottom of the screen. Here we have the CloudWatch log. And here you can see all those recent invocations and also most expensive invocations in GB second. You can go to CloudWatch log. There also you can see all those invocations log. Here you go. I have all those log streams. I have anomaly detection, matrix filter, everything is there. Now, one last thing. Here we have the X-ray. Since we haven't enabled, that is why the service map is not there. I can show you the configuration, how you can enable X-ray. So go to configuration. Here you have monitoring and operation tool. You can edit additional monitoring tool. And for AWS X-ray, you can active that tracing. Now, once you will do that and save, after that, any invocation, it will be tracked and it will create that service map. I'm not going to wait for this one, but if you want, you can play around and you can test that. So I'll go ahead and again deactivate X-ray for me. Next is Lambda in a VPC. In this section, we will review how to launch a Lambda function inside a VPC. Before explaining the concept, let's understand what use case required Lambda to be launched inside a VPC. We will use a three tier application architecture for this example. Let's assume we have an EC2 instance in a private subnet and one RDS database, maybe in a different private subnet. I can place the EC2 instance in a private subnet or in a public subnet. If RDS security group allows connection from EC2 security group, then we can establish connection from EC2 to RDS. Then how about Lambda? Can I access the RDS database from the Lambda functions we have launched so far? Although we can connect DynamoDB and Amazon S3 from Lambda, but by default, from Lambda functions we launched so far, won't be able to establish connection to Amazon RDS inside a private subnet or with any AWS services placed inside a VPC like Elasticast internal load balancer. Then what is the solution? To connect resources inside a VPC, we must launch the Lambda function inside a VPC. While creating the Lambda function, we must specify VPC ID, subnet, and the security group. When we launch a Lambda function inside a VPC, it will place an ENI or Elastic Network Interface inside the VPC subnet we have specified. Using that ENI, Lambda will be able to establish connection to the RDS database. One point we must remember, 
lambda function launched inside a vpc will not have internet access even if the function is launched inside a public subnet now let's review how can we provide internet access to the lambda function launched inside a vpc let's take simplified version of an architecture diagram where we have launched the lambda function inside a vpc private subnet the first option is we can launch a nat gateway in public subnet using the nat gateway and internet gateway of your vpc the lambda function can reach internet or establish connection to internet how about connecting aws services like dynamo db and s3 option 1 you can use the previous setup that is nat gateway and internet gateway to establish connection to amazon s3 and amazon dynamo db using the services public url but if you have a requirement to connect privately using aws backbone network then you can create a vpc endpoint for amazon s3 and dynamo db and privately connect amazon s3 and dynamo db without exposing the traffic to internet this will be your option 2 let's discuss one more connection use case let's assume we want to connect to a third party external api how can we do that if you want to solve by your own you can pause the video here and write down the solution in a paper then unpause the video and review with me we can connect the external api using option 1 that is using nat gateway and the internet gateway the most important point is your lambda function execution role should have explicit privileges to create eni when you want to launch a lambda inside the vpc and this is the role your lambda function execution role should have now let's solidify the concept using a demo i'll create a new function and i'll provide the name as lambda vpc i will use runtime as python 3.12 and i'll change the default role to the role lambda canary demo in the advanced settings i can go and i can enable vpc then i can choose the vpc but before that i need to create a security group so let me first go to ec2 console and there i create a security group i'll go to ec2 i'll go to network and security and then i'll create a security group I'll provide a name as lambda sg. I'll copy the same name to description. I'll put the VPC, the default VPC, and then I'll create the security group. I'll go back to my lambda function. I'll choose that VPC, and then I'll choose the subnet. Maybe I'll select three subnets here, and these are all public subnets for me. And then I'll choose the security group. I'll choose the lambda security group. and then i'll create the function so this is saying provider execution role does not have permission to create network interface on ec2 so what i am going to do i am going to modify the permission i'll go to iam i'll go to role and i'll choose the lambda canary demo role and what permissions we have i'll add, add permission attach policy and i'll attach administration access because this is not a iam class i don't want to debug all those role related or privilege related access but as i mentioned multiple times for your implementational use case please use principle of least privilege so the role has been updated i'll go to my lambda function and i'll try to create the function again it will take some times to create the lambda function inside vpc as it will create the eni first then it will create the lambda function meanwhile we can go to gitlab repo and we will copy the code from lambda vpc demo while this function is creating we can create one more function in parallel the second function will be a regular lambda function and i will not launch inside a vpc i'll provide the name as lambda no vpc demo I'll choose the runtime as Python 3.12. I'll choose the previous role what we modified just now because I want both the lambda function should have same privileges. I'll create the function. Then I'll replace the template code. And here what we are trying to do we are trying to access the S3 and we are trying to find out 
what are the buckets we have in my account. So I'll deploy and I'll test. And test. So I have one S3 bucket that is the cloud expert solution. Lambda VPC it is still creating. It will take some time. I can pause this video here. I can come back once the Lambda function will be created successfully. It took more than two minutes for me. Now the Lambda function has been created successfully. Now if I will go ahead and replace that code with the same code that we have executed in the Lambda no VPC. The same thing what we are doing, we are importing the Boto function, then creating a S3 client. And then we are trying to get all those bucket names and we are passing that bucket name. Now let's deploy that code. But this time, Lambda function will not be able to connect to S3 because the Lambda function has been launched inside a VPC. By default, it does not have an internet connectivity. That is why it won't be able to reach to the S3 to pull the bucket name. Now let's test and it should go for a timeout. Error message, task timeout. Now let's go to configuration, general configuration, modify the time limit to let's say 10 seconds. For this case, if I'll test, I'm getting a response in milliseconds. But if I'll go to the Lambda VPC here, if I'll test, since the Lambda function was launched inside a VPC, it won't be able to reach and that is what it is getting timeout exceptions. Yes, again timeout because I haven't created a NAT gateway, I haven't modified the route tables and all. That is why this VPC is not able to access S3 bucket or DynamoDB or any internet connectivity. Next, Lambda containers. Lambda container is a very important topic and this is the latest upgrade from AWS for Lambda. Now you can run container image or containerized Lambda functions in Lambda environment. So you can deploy a Lambda function with a container image. Now let's review the prerequisites. You should have ECR or Elastic Container Registry activated for your AWS account. And the Docker image you are going to use, it should have a runtime interface and it should have the latest version of Python. During Lambda external dependencies, we saw that to run a Lambda function, we need Lambda function code, Lambda dependencies, Lambda configurations and runtime. What we can do, we can pack everything in a Docker container. So when you are going to create the Docker container or the Docker file, first you can use a base image. And please remember the base image must include a Lambda runtime interface. You have couple of options to select the base image. The option one is AWS base image. AWS base images are preloaded with a language runtime. The second option you can take AWS OS only base image. AWS OS only base image contains an Amazon Linux distribution and runtime interface emulator for Lambda. Or the third option is you can go for a non AWS base image. That means you can go to Docker Hub and you can take from other third party registry such that Alpine Linux or Debian. You can use those as base image. Now on top of that base image, you have to pack those dependencies, configurations, data sets, and then application code. AWS base images are available for Node.js, TypeScript, Python, Java, Go, .NET, and Ruby. So now if you want to create Lambda container for any other languages, you can use either AWS OS only base image or non AWS base image and you can implement your custom runtime. Now let's try to understand the process. Let's we have a user, then they are creating that code. They are pushing that code to AWS code commit. Once the code is there in the code commit, with the code commit event, code commit will trigger AWS code build. Now code build, will create that image or it will create the Docker image and it will publish the Docker image to ECR. Then AWS Lambda at the time of creation, it will pull that image from ECR and it will deploy that Lambda function. You have to remember some limitations. Now maximum image size is 10 GB 
and maximum run time is 15 minutes. So if you have any Lambda container, it should execute within 15 minutes. If your container is running more than 15 minutes, then Lambda is not the runtime for you. You can go to ECS or EKS or Fargate. If you want to learn Docker or understand in depth how to create Docker containers, we have a dedicated Zero to Hero course on Docker available on our channel. It provides comprehensive Docker knowledge from start to finish. I will provide the YouTube URL in the video description. Now let's go to AWS Management Console and see how to deploy Lambda containers. I am back to my AWS Lambda dashboard. I am going to create a new Lambda function. To create Lambda function, we have three options. And we have discussed at the beginning of the video that if you remember, I will cover all the three options. For Lambda container, instead of authoring from scratch, you have to select container image option. Then you can provide the function name. You don't have an option to choose the runtime. Rather, you need to select the container image URI. You can either directly paste the ECR image URI or select the image using browse image option. I don't have a ready-made container image that I can deploy, but as I mentioned, I have a course to teach you how to create Docker image. For your implementation use case, please create the Docker image and select the image URL and then create function. The only difference from the previous Lambda launches here, instead of selecting runtime and Lambda creating a boilerplate code, you select the container image that you want to run. I hope this explains the process. If you want me to create a step-by-step -step process, please drop your request as comment to this video. I'll be happy to create a separate video for this topic. Next, we are going to review Lambda at Edge. In this section, we are going to talk about Lambda at Edge and how you can use Lambda at Edge with your CloudFront distributions. Before I explain Lambda at Edge, now let's try to understand a CloudFront architecture. We have a CloudFront distribution and we have two different regions, maybe S3 bucket for the static content and ALB for the dynamic content. Behind the ALB, we have EC2 instances in auto scaling group and then we have one database. This session is dedicated to AWS Lambda. That is why I will not go in depth on how CloudFront works. On a high level, we use CloudFront for content delivery to global user base or content caching using AWS Edge location or even accelerated dynamic content delivery. If you want to get protection against DDoS attack, we can use CloudFront. In addition to CloudFront, if you want to implement or if you have a requirement for website security and privacy, if you want to add HTTP security header on all the origin responses without modifying the application code on your origin, or maybe you want dynamic web application at the edge, maybe you want to build powerful web application and automatically scale up and scale down with zero origin infrastructure and administrative effort. Maybe you are looking for search engine optimization, or maybe you are looking for intelligently route request across origin and data centers, or maybe you want bot mitigation at the edge, or maybe real-time image transformation based on your devices, or maybe user authentication and authorization, or maybe user prioritization. Maybe you have paid users and you have content for the paid users. You have separate content for the free users and you want to distribute that content based on the user category or even if you want to go for the user tracking and analysis or a b testing if you have any one of the use case then you can use lambda at edge and you can these are the special lambdas that you are deploying at the edge locations with cloudfront and lambda at edge can help you to implement all those use case very efficiently there is one more alternative and this is relatively new offering from AWS. You can use CloudFront functions also for the same purpose. Now let's try to understand the difference between Lambda at Edge and CloudFront functions and what are the cases you should use or where you should use Lambda at Edge and where you can use CloudFront functions. Now this is on a high level architecture diagram. We have a client 
we have a cloud fund distributions and maybe we have a origin as application load balancer when the viewers are requesting or when the client is requesting for any content that is the viewer request because viewer is requesting here now if the content is available cloudfront will send that response if that is not available in the cache location the cloudfront will fetch from the origin and that becomes a origin request because cloudfront is requesting from the origin then origin will process that request and it will send origin response. Once CloudFront will receive that response, it will cache that response and then it will back the viewer response. So that is how the request works using CloudFront. Now, if you'll go a little deep into CloudFront, CloudFront is divided into two different components, edge locations and regional edge caches. As of today, AWS has 400 edge locations and 13 regional cache. So your viewer request first, it will hit to edge cache. If it is not there, then it will go to regional edge cache and from there it will go to origin request. If I'll divide that into two parts, that is the viewer part versus the origin part. And now let's try to understand where you can use Lambda at edge versus where you can use CloudFront functions. CloudFront functions, these are lightweight functions that are written in JavaScript and you can only use to modify viewer request and viewer response. That means you will deploy CloudFront functions in edge locations. Now your CloudFront functions will come here and it will only modify viewer request and viewer response. Unlike to CloudFront functions, you can use Lambda at edge to modify both viewer request, viewer response and origin request and origin response. And you will deploy Lambda at edge at regional edge caches. So Lambda at edge can be used to modify both origin request response and viewer request response. You can write both in Node.js or Python. There is no free tier. Please remember, Lambda at edge, there is no free tier unlike normal Lambda and charges are based on the request and the duration. Once you will write AWS Lambda into one AWS region, CloudFront will automatically replicate that to other regions. Now let's go to AWS Lambda console and let's see how you can create. I'm in my AWS management console and in the Lambda dashboard. I'll first create a function before creating this function, let me take you to our GitLab repo and let me show you where I have all those codes and configurations. We have Lambda Edge CloudFront. Here I have three artifacts. First, the Lambda. I have two Lambda functions and here I have used JavaScript. One, I have the viewer request and then I have the origin response. So these two Lambda functions you have and then if I'll go back to the original function, I have a Docker file where I have listed all those steps, how you can do. And once you will run that, it will create a Lambda container for you. And then the other artifacts. Here I have all those step-by-step -step processes, then the S3 bucket policy. In that S3 bucket policy, I have mentioned that this is the bucket policy you need for what are the permissions. And then I have that YML. If, if you want to deploy using cloud formation, then I have created a cloud formation template also for you. If you'll run that cloud formation template, then it will create Lambda at H function for you. Now let me go to the Lambda dashboard. And here we will use the blueprint. From the blueprint name, I can type CloudFront. And here you can see modify HTTP response header. Provide a function name. I will use viewer request lambda. The runtime is Node.js. Since we are using Blueprint and the Blueprint was written using Node.js, that is why we do not have an option to select a runtime for this lambda function. Now you can create a new role using the AWS template and the template is already selected. Now this is the lambda function code, it is already there. And now you can create a function. When you will create that function, it will deploy at the cloud front. It will deploy at your edge location. I'll go to cloud front. Now in this account, I do not have a cloud front. 
that I can maintain or I do not have any use case for cloud fund. That is why I won't be able to deploy this function. On the other hand, Lambda at H also does not have a free tier. And just for this demo, I don't want my AWS account to incur any unnecessary charges. That is why I won't deploy this function. However, I have provided the complete package to create a Lambda at Edge function, which will resize images based on the viewer's device type like mobile, desktop or tablet. I have also shown you the steps how to create Lambda at Edge function. As a bonus material, I have given the cloud formation template that you can use to automatically create the function if you don't want to create manually. I hope my effort will help you to implement Lambda at H successfully. In this section, we are going to review Lambda function URL. So far we have seen, we have a client, we have a Lambda function. If you want to access the Lambda function, either we need a API gateway or a load balancer. Your client is accessing the Lambda function using an API gateway or an AWS load balancer. But with Lambda function URL, we can eliminate the API gateway or we can eliminate the application load balancer and we can expose the Lambda function with a URL and that URL can be accessible through public internet only. Please remember Lambda function URL is accessible only through public internet. You can invoke via web browser, Postman or any HTTP client but you cannot invoke Lambda function using AWS private link. You can create Lambda function URL on your latest function or function aliases, but not on version. Please remember that fact that you can create function URL only on the latest or function aliases. If you want to implement throttling, then you can use reserve concurrency. If you set that reserve concurrency, maybe 100, then your Lambda will go to 100. And by that way, the clients will not be able to access Lambda more than 100 invocations. Now in terms of authentication type, Lambda function URL support two different authentication. First one is IAM authentication. That means only authenticated IAM users will be able to access. And second, none. That means Lambda won't perform any IAM authentication. In terms of invocation method, we have two you can go for the buffer and that is the default. Here the maximum payload size is 6 MB. If you want to go for a higher payload size, you can go and you can choose response stream. But response stream will come with additional cost. Optionally, you can enable codes that means cross origin resource sharing on your Lambda function if you are accessing the Lambda function from a different domain. Now let's go back to AWS Management Console and see that in action. I am in my Lambda dashboard and now let's try to take the Lambda version for this demo. If I'll go to versions, yes, I have versions and I have aliases. We will use this Lambda function for our Lambda function URL demo. To create a Lambda function URL, I'll go to configuration. From the left hand side, I'll select function URL and create function URL. As we discussed, we have two different authentication type. One is AWS IAM and one is none. I don't want any authentication. And that is why this policy will be attached. And then additional settings. Here I have the invocation mode, either buffered or response stream. Since this is chargeable, I am going to use the buffered mode. I really do not need to configure cross origin resource sharing. That is why I will not opt for this. I will save this. Here you can see your function URL is public. Anyone with this URL can access your function. So I'll copy this URL. I'll go to my web browser. I'll paste. Here you go. This is Lambda version two. What we are doing, we are accessing this alias. Now let's go back and we'll try to create based on the version. Now let's go back. This time we'll select one version. Maybe we'll select the version two stage. This is, I have selected the alias. Maybe I'll go to Lambda version. Version and I'll select the version. You can see if I select the version and if I come to function URL, it is saying you can add a function URL only to unpublished version 
or to an alias. I won't be able to select a version to create function URL here. Now let's go back to my Lambda function and we can delete this function URL because I do not need it anymore. So I'll delete this Lambda function URL. In this section, we are going to talk about Lambda CI CD. While discussing the version alias, I talk about the Canary demo, but let's dive deep into this and let's see how we can deploy Lambda function and how we can change the Lambda code. Let's say I have Lambda version one, that is my current production version. Now I have a new code and I have a new version called Lambda version two. Now let's try to understand how I'll be able to publish my new version version two as production. Let's say I have a developer, they are developing that code and I have created a AWS code pipeline. As part of that, developer will push that code to code commit once all the code is completed. And based on the push event, code commit will invoke code build. Now code build will generate the artifact. I can use the S3 bucket to store all those code artifacts. Then after that, the code build will invoke the code deploy and code deploy will come into picture and code deploy will take care of the deployment. Behind the scene, it will invoke AWS SAM or the serverless application model and serverless application model, it will launch a cloud formation template and using the cloud formation template, it will create the Lambda version V2. Now what we can do, we can do a traffic switch between the Lambda version or broad aliases that we have already seen in the demo. We have attached two version with the broad alias and we can put that canary kind of thing. So let's say we are passing X percentage. It's a very small number, could be 5%, 10% and rest of the traffic is going to your original function or the production. Now you have three options, how you can transition from version one to version two. First option is linear deployment. That means for the first five minutes, only 10%, the next five minutes, 20%, next five minutes, 30%, like that way, you will increase the traffic till the point version V1 will get zero. That is why it's called linear deployment. Now we can choose linear 10% every five minutes, that means, it will start with 10% traffic to the V2 and every five minutes it will increment the traffic to 10% and then it will continue till the time the version V1 will get 0% or maybe linear 10% every 10 minutes. So like that way you can use linear deployment method to flip the traffic from version V1 to V2. Second option is canary deployment. Here the traffic if you already saw Maybe for the first five minutes, you are putting 10% if everything is fine. And then the entire 90% of the traffic after the T minutes. Here you have option canary 10% five minutes or canary 10% 15 minutes like that way. So canary 10% five minutes means 10% traffic will go to V2 for the first five minutes. If everything is okay, then the entire traffic will be shifted from V1 to V2. And there is a third option all at once. That means immediately every traffic will shift from V1 to V2 at once. So these are the way you can implement Lambda CI CD and you can implement or you can refresh your Lambda version. In this section, we are going to talk about different Lambda limits that you should know. And we have broken into two parts. One is the deployment and execution and then the function wise limit. To start with, Lambda deployment and execution quotas. The first one is the concurrent execution. It is thousand. It is a soft limit and you can increase up to tens of thousand. For that, you have to create a service request to AWS. Next one is execution duration. Lambda function can be executed for 900 seconds or 15 minutes and you cannot modify this limit. And then function memory allocation. You can allocate 128 MB to 10 GB with an increment of 1 MB. Lambda layer, you can assign at max five layers that you have already seen. Environmental variables, you can have environmental variables up to 4 KB 
for all environmental variable associated with that particular function. Then deployment package size. If you have deployment package as a zipped format, you can have up to 50 MB. And if you have unzipped, then it will be 250 MB. Now in terms of compute and storage quotas, currently Lambda support upload up to 75 GB and can be increased up to terabytes. To increase, this is a soft limit. To increase, you have to create a service request to AWS. Then Lambda at VPC, you can have 250. This is a soft limit and you can increase up to thousands. Container image size, it will be up to 16 KB. Now team directory storage, you can have from 512 MB to 10 GB with an increment of 1 MB. Test event, during that course, we have all those tests and we have created those test event for one function, you can create up to 10 test events. Please remember these Lambda quotas are as per Feb 2024. If you are reviewing this video, maybe after six months, some of the quotas may change. So it's best practice to review the Lambda quotas in AWS documentation. So please refer AWS documentation if you see any changes from these limits. Now we are at the end phase of today's session. Just like all other zero to hero session, we'll close today's session with Lambda best practices. To start with, you should separate Lambda handler code from the core business logic. And please remember all the best practices we'll discuss that will be common across all Lambda land times. Next, you should take advantage of execution environment reuse to improve the performance of your function. That means you should initialize SDK client database connections outside the function handler and cache the static asset locally in the team directory. Then please use environmental variable to pass operational parameter to your function. Then you can minimize your deployment package size to its runtime necessity. Please remove all other additional packages that is absolutely not required. You should avoid using recursive code in your Lambda function. This is directly coming from AWS documentation and AWS does not recommend to use recursive code in your Lambda function. Do not use non-documented or non-public APIs. Write idem potent code for your Lambda functions. For asynchronous invocation, by default Lambda retries two times. And also if you need to reprocess the request, it's best practice to validate for duplicate processing. Now you have to be familiar with Lambda quotas we have already discussed. And please remember that if you have any functions that is running for more than 15 minutes, then it's not a Lambda use case and it is a Lambda anti-pattern. And last but not least, monitor your uses of AWS Lambda as it's related to security best practices by using Security Hub. That was all for today. I know this session was a little lengthy one, but we covered all the Lambda topics so that you don't have to scan multiple YouTube videos to learn AWS Lambda. Also, we have included demos for the related topics and we want you to have a solid understanding after completing this session. So you can implement your knowledge directly after watching this video. If you like our effort, Please give us a thumbs up and please share this video with your friends and families. Subscribe to our channel and please click on the bell icon for more content like this. Thank you for watching.